Hello and welcome to Nigan Report, your weekly roundup of all the latest Nigan news and all other photograph commands. With that, we found the interesting question here. And this is Becky. All right, let's get straight to it. Apparently, in the UK and Europe, there's a new promotion in town. Yes, there is. And I can officially talk about it. A 10% instant discount off Nikon's interchangeable lenses. And this is across F-mount and Z-mount lenses, with a few specific exceptions. Understandably, the more kind of exotic lenses, the harder to get hold of, are not included, such as the 58mm f0.95 Noct, the 100-400, because Nikon recently suspended orders on the 100-400 due to a backlog in supply. 402.8, the 600 f4 and the 800 6.3 those are all excluded pretty much everything else which is about 70 i think i counted about 75 odd lenses mm -hmm. is all included so that's 10 percent off the price straight away no like 100 off or 50 off etc and then that's including mirrorless lenses as well as f-mount lenses correct so if you watched our podcast a couple of weeks ago i did ask Becky a question about the room of 10 percent off and she looked and said i don't know anything about it so when is that eight coming out becky <laughs> I can't tell you that, or I'd have to kill you. Yeah, can't, you know, so it's all the imaginary NDA stuff that we clearly don't have, but it's good to know. It is good, yeah. The 10% off runs until the 6th of March, and the prices are immediately discounted on the website, so there's no need to remember a code or any such thing. You can just go online, add stuff to your basket. It's all immediately discounted for you, and enjoy. Fantastic. Let's move on to the next news. Z5 users rejoice. Nikon released their firmware update version 1.4 with some autofocus improvements. Yeah, so they've added support for various bits and pieces, including the MCN10 remote group, the MLL7, which is a fantastic addition. So you can now have a Bluetooth remote control. Mm -hmm. They've also added eye detection autofocus for video recording and the custom settings for some of the newer lenses which weren't around when the Z5's last firmware was updated so that includes 70 to 200 2.8 the 400s and the 800 mil um, they also improved eye detection performance for the auto area AF so that means that we could have some very interesting autofocus capabilities on the Z5 now. Definitely. Have a look at Matt Irwin's video about that firmware update on actual test and see how much it improved. Yeah, they also improved the refresh rate for focus points displayed in live view when doing subject tracking and face slash eye detection AF. And the final bigger one is the behavior of autofocus during memory recall has been improved to ensure that the focus position will not change in any focus mode, even if the shutter release button is pressed halfway while focus recall is in progress. That's pretty cool. So all that love that was given to Z6 and Z7 cameras finally came to Z5, which is fantastic. As we always say, it's great that you can support in all the cameras. And as usual, Z6 Mark II and Z7 Mark II users, tell us what you think in the comments below. Nice. Okay, now to the next one. Nikon published their CP Plus schedule. So they launched the whole website where they show their schedule for the speakers, what they're going to show on the stands, lots of interesting things. The rumor is they're not going to announce anything, but at least they'll have on display what's available. Fingers crossed, maybe, maybe you'll see something. I know the Casino is about to announce something for Voidland at CP Plus, so who knows, it could be a Nikon-related news. Tamron is also rumored to make an announcement on 22nd of February, so again, some fun stuff. So who knows, maybe we will see some at least Nikon release announcement instead of just a Nikon announcement on this expo. Now, an interesting news came in from the patent world. On 16th of February, Nikon published patent applications for several lenses, including the unreleased 600mm f5.6 PF and 1000mm f8 PF lenses. All of those paintings have a diffractive optical elements. Now, they were patents for 404.5 as well as 806.3. Mm. Now, those lenses have obviously been released already. However, they had diffractive optical elements in those patents the actual releases don't have them. Mm -hmm. But it's just interesting to see, as we discussed in the past, we definitely want to see a 600, something like 5.6, maybe 6.3, yeah. just to kind of complete that trilogy of less expensive, lightweight, long telephoto lenses. Yes. But there's also a 1,000 F8 in the mix, which could be fun. 
to have. I think it's quite exciting. Nikon in the past have made a 1000mm. It was an f11 and it was a reflex or mirror lens. They also made a 500 f8 mirror lens. It would be interesting to see a 1000mm f8 and what that looks like in Z design though, because their lenses are, particularly the higher aperture lenses, are actually quite small and compact. And in a review that will hopefully come out within the next couple of weeks for you all on the 600mm f4, we talk about the beauty of having a potential for a 600, 5.6 or 6.3, so. That's interesting, actually. Do you think we'll ever see a mirror design from all those mirror lenses? Mm. Not mirrorless, but mirror lenses applied to a new lenses, like 1000 F8. I don't know if the technology if that technology needs to be implemented now, I think that it's a bit outdated, can, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I think that it was a solution to a, a light gathering problem, which they don't have anymore. And I think that probably whatever we see next would be sans mirror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something more up to date with all the latest tech. That's my thought. Sounds interesting. Obviously, with all patents, it can mean nothing because Nikon normally registers more patents than the actual releases coming out. And in recent years, they actually slowed down on the patents, but it doesn't mean that the hit rate is going to be smaller as well. So you never know, but fingers crossed, hopefully we will see the 600 at 5.6 or I think 6.3 in the future, and maybe even 1000 F8. There you go. The next one up, Nikon is building a new lens factory worth of 30 billion yen in Toshigi, Japan. The new facility will produce lenses for microscopes, cameras, and semiconductor equipment, which is good. And they are aiming to start production in 2026. Okay, so they plan to invest 30 billion yen. There was an old factory there that Nikon is going to rebuild as well. It's interesting based on the news on the several things. So this whole China situation and all the sanctions on semiconductors imposed in China, mm -hmm. where you can't import those semiconductors mm -hmm. for production in China. Yes. So what that means that a lot of companies like Sony, they moved out their factory. I think 90% of their factories are now in Thailand. Right instead of China. Some of the news that we didn't report last week, but there was a talks between USA and Japan, as well as Netherlands, and the companies who have factories in China with regards to those sanctions. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we know that you can manufacture semiconductors in there. So yeah. it could be to do with that. Yeah, It could be something else. Obviously, we would love to see Nikon moving their production back to Japan because it's a Japanese company. It's nice if things are made in the same country. Yes. From other point, we live in a global world, so it doesn't really matter because of global bill. So you just look at the, your labor costs. The quality of production stays pretty much the same. It doesn't matter what country is making it. But just an interesting development. Yeah, I do think it is encouraging to see that Nikon are planning to build onto their existing production so that they can increase production capacity as opposed to downsizing, which we've seen a lot of in recent years, or, you know, cutting operations, making them smaller. So this is a promising sign that perhaps when future releases occur or when parts are needed for new cameras, lenses, etc., there won't be such a long wait potentially because they've increased their production. Well, the rumor is maybe they're planning to actually increase their sales and they hope that, uh, that if demand is higher, then we can produce more mm. to sell. Obviously, if you look at their 2030 plans, and yes. if you look at the current reports, they trying to stay within the same numbers, yeah. but increase their margins. So very different angles we can look at it. But what I also want to talk about is the we reported on the Q3 financials we last week, and then Nikon publishes Q&A from that session, normally a week after. And there was a question to do with those sanctions that media reported last week. And the question was, media reports on new regulations to be introduced to exports of semiconductors lithography system destined for China. How would this impact business performance moving forward? So what they say is that they're aware of media reports about discussions among government officials from the United States, Netherlands, and Japan. However, it is our understanding that is no official announcement has been made. If there were some official announcement issued by the Japanese government with clear guidelines and the like, of course, we would act in compliance of those rules. Mm. So media reports on those talks, there's nothing official as of yet. And Nikon's position is if something's happening within the government, Japanese government, then they would follow the guidelines. Exactly. Too right. Now, on the subject of the financials, 
there is one other question that we wanted to highlight and uh, I will put it to you and you can read the answer or vice versa. Hello, hello, it's Constantine, uh, straight <laughs> from the press conference. The question was, is your Q4, fourth quarter operating profit forecast, too conservative? So they projected lower income effectively, lower profit. Also, please share your outlook for the next fiscal year and beyond. So what they said, basically, Q4 report is always lower because it happens after Christmas. So it's mm -hmm. basically months between January and March. Yes, tough, tough quarter, that one. Exactly. Q3 is normally where people buy things. It's, you know, we have Black Friday, we have obviously lots of holidays. So people buying lots of gifts and spending a lot. Q4 is the time where everyone is resting. People's spending habits are generally low as well because obviously they spend a lot of money pre-holiday season. Yes. So everyone is tightening their belts and trying to save. And then in Q1, which is generally happens in spring, yes. so before people get on holidays, we start to see another wave of purchases where people buying their lenses for their holidays. So it's, I would say their Q4 expectations is in line with previous years. So there's really nothing to see here. Good. Now let's go to some community news. Yeah, so we have the Z9 battery secrets. All right. Now, DP Review forum user Marianne Oland published this in a forum in recent days. She said, for many years, I had an idea kicking around in my head to add a current monitoring loop to a camera body or battery so I could study the camera's current draw and thus its power use. Up through the D5 generation, battery capacity was never a problem. But with the arrival of the Z9, I had a powerful incentive to finally get set up to do such a study. Okay, so let's rephrase it. So obviously with DSLRs, mm -hmm. we didn't use the screen at the back of the camera for live view function. Not and, as much anyway. And when the live view function happened on D5, it would drain the battery quite a bit. Yes. So, but generally you wouldn't use it because you would shoot with a normal DSLR. So you look through the optical viewfinder that doesn't have a screen inside. Yeah. And it takes the picture. So the battery life was enormous. But that was happening in the past. Now, because we eliminated the mirror, now we have actually electronic screen in the viewfinder as well as the back of the camera. And we have constant stream of the data from the sensor into those EVF and LCD. Yes. So obviously the power drain is a lot higher. It is. And that's why she is writing about it. She was concerned that even if Z9 is a flagship, how much is the power draw and will it affect her usage of the camera? Yeah, so what she goes on to say is, what I didn't realize at the start was just how much information one can glean from monitoring battery current with the scope and meters. Suffice it to say, it turned into quite an epic project. Several weeks, 20 pages of notes and dozens of saved scope screenshots later, I've learned enough that it's going to take a number of posts here to describe the essentials. So then she basically modifies the Wasabi battery, which is a third party battery. Don't do it at home, folks, unless you know what you're doing. But she connects it to that device and she starts to monitor certain things. And what she's writing is that basically the battery current waveforms reveal the Z9 imaging pipeline frame rate, also folks motor current, and details of the image taken sequence. Also, it's possible to investigate how the various battery charges work. So, for example, what she found out is in l 18 d battery, power draw is about 35 watt per hour. And in standby mode, it's actually for the first 30 minutes, it draws about half of it, so about 18 watts per hour. And that's to do with the topping up the internal battery. Mm -hmm. You know, that keeps your date and the settings, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's for about 30 minutes. Then it's actually almost stops down and draws only 400 microamperes, which is very low, that would take about a year to drain the battery from the fully charged state. So that's quite cool. She also discovered that live view with autofocus active with the electronic viewfinder at 120 hertz draws 7.35 watts, which will work at 4.7 hours of constant use. So without autofocus engaged, it's a little bit lower current. Yeah. So, but we're talking about constant use of the camera. So the Forum topic is still current, so the, she's still adding the comments into the thread. So do definitely have a look at this and maybe join you if you have something interesting to add. Now, another thing from the forums, mm. this update on the quantity of 800 millimeters shipped to users. We mentioned a couple of weeks ago, now this tally is up to 4,200 lenses plus. So that's a lot of lenses in yes, this range. it is. I can't remember the last time 
anyone monitored the distribution of one specific lens. And it's funny that it's the 800 mil, but I suppose there are still people out there waiting for theirs. Yeah. And maybe that's why they're monitoring it this closely. It's just, it's quite interesting. But it's also interesting that the community in Hall creates this type of project. Yeah. From battery research to quantities of landship to the users. It's always nice. And while we call you the internet detectives, we praise the effort put into it and as a community as a whole, adding this important data for us nerds, aka geeks, aka Nick and users. <laughs> Speak for yourself. No, I'm just kidding. And now for some slightly less good news, there has been a huge Nikon price increase in Sweden between 10 and 20%. For example, the Nikon Z9 went from 64,995 Swedish kroner to a whopping 72,990 Swedish kroner, whilst the 402.8 went from 164,990 to 179,990. That's 15,000 kroner more expensive. That's a lot of kroners. I it's guess there's a short ride to another country then for the purchase of your Nikon. All I remember from Sweden is the Swedes were a lot cheaper than Norway. And a lot of Norwegians would cross the border to buy the Swedes and then go back. To buy Swedes from Sweden? Yes. <laughs> Here's a fun fact. Well, thanks for the fun fact. All right, the next one up is Nikon donated 5 million yen, which is around $37,000 to the weeks of earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Yes, their press release said the Nikon group would like to express its profound sympathy and condolences to the victims of the earthquake that struck Turkey and Syria on February 6, 2023. In response to this tragedy and to extend a support to its victims, the Nikon group has decided to provide the following assistance, a cash donation of 5 million yen made to the Japanese Red Cross. The next one up, Nikon Museum in Japan will have an exhibition which is called Attraction of AI Nico, a photo exhibition by Nikon employees. So the exhibition is going to be held from March the 1st till September the 2nd, 2023. There will be 80 AI Nico lenses on display, about 80 photographs taken by Nikon employees with those lenses. And there's also going to be a slideshow with about 50 images. Fun times. On to some Nikon owner news. The brand new issue, which is issue number 77, is just about to hit your mailboxes if you have not already seen the online version. The print version for you print subscribers is out now. Joe McNally's covers and a fantastic article by Becky Donese in this issue. <laughs> Did you read it? No. <laughs> There's some lovely stuff in this magazine. So if you're not already a subscriber, we do have a link for you to subscribe in the description box because we're nice like that. And if you are, then you'll look forward to receiving that hopefully in the next coming week. Fantastic. All right, let's move on to some Nikon related third party news. First one up is Adobe added tethering support for Nikon Z9 camera. So it's Mac OS only for now. The Windows implementation is coming, but it's quite nice to have a tethering for your camera after about a year it came out, but you know, it's better late than never. So we say. We also have Raycan Focal software, which is version 3.7 Pro, supporting a snapshots feature. A snapshot is a settings file, so you can save your camera settings files in named files on your computers. You can edit them on your computer, push the edited saved snapshot back to your camera, and there you have it. Very useful for some. Yeah, so also, Rake and Focal is the software that allows you to automatically fine tune your Nikon cameras. So you have automatic fine tune within the cameras nowadays, but if you wanna hook your camera up to the laptop and draw it through your laptop, you can do this, you can put out a test chart and then do that this way. It's quite fun. Tom Hogan is really digging that feature and apparently he's been playing with the new version of Focal and he said it's a really good start. It's not a complete one yet, but his initial reaction is good and he's in touch with them to improve on that setting. But basically, yeah, you can save your things on the computer from your camera, edit them on your computer, put it back into the camera and this all will work just fine. Magic. Now. Trying to kill me today. We have a CP numbers for whole year though. Not for months, but mm. for a whole year. So I think it's an interesting one because we will see how many cameras were sold in 2022 compared to 2021. Excellent. And that should give us a bit of an insight of 
how photography industry is doing. All right, the first one up is the total units of cameras that's been shipped this year. So it's 5.927 million, which is 10.8% up compared to last year. Now, fun fact, Nikon predicted about 5.29 million DSLR mirrors body shipped in Canada year of 2022. Mm. So it's bigger than that, which is quite good. So in 2021, they shipped 5.3 million. So it's a little bit better. And in 2020, they even shipped less during the yes. COVID. So it seems like the industry is getting bigger. Yeah. Little steps, but 10% up is definitely a good year in my books. I think that's a big improvement. So of those units, we have DSLRs. Now, this is in comparison to 2021's full year. So DSLR units was 1.85 million, which is actually 17% down on the previous year. And that came to a value of 86.7 billion yen, which is 5% down on in terms of value. Obviously, I think that has a lot to do with the lower value DSLRs being phased out and higher value DSLRs are the ones being shipped. On another hand, the mirrorless units have increased by 31%. And the shipped value increased by 61%. So overall, if you look at the market of units shipped, mirrorless now takes 69% of all interchangeable lens cameras and 86% of shipped value. So huge improvement there. So DSLRs are going down, mirrorless improving, and also the compact units are also going down, but that's kind of been happening for last forever. It has. So compact units was down by 31%, which is quite a large amount. Then we move on to lenses. So lenses for smaller than 35mm units. Mm -hmm. so DX, APS-C. APS-C or potentially micro four thirds mm -hmm. or anything else that's lurking out there was up by 1%. So that was 5 million units. Lenses for anything from full frame and above was up by 3%. So that was 4.7 million units. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the lenses, yeah. I don't think anything happened in, in effectively in DX range. So it seems more or less the same. Yeah. And it's improving just because the overall market is growing. Yes. So with the full frame, though, we definitely start to see an increase in shipped value. It's by 33%, while actually overall sales increased by 3%. So mm -hmm. it seems like with the price hikes and also effectively releasing a more expensive lenses, the amount of money has been sold is 33% higher yeah. compared to the last year, True. which hopefully improves on the margin for all of the manufacturers. Yes, exactly. Another interesting statistic is the ratio of lenses to bodies shipped. So it's 1.64 lenses for every camera that is shipped. It was 1.79 mm. for 2021. So this is down a little bit, which means that people are buying 1.64 lenses for every camera that they buy instead of 1.79. Mm. It's an interesting one. I'm not sure what it is, but I wonder if people who got the mirrorless cameras, they already have the lenses. Mm, so, maybe. So if they're upgrading a mirrorless camera to another mirrorless camera, then they're not going to buy another lens to go with it. No, sure. So that could be that, at least looking at Nikon's time in the mirrorless system and Canon's because they came in around the same time. Obviously, Sony's been in the game for quite some time, as well as Olympus and Fuji, but it's an interesting development. Now, let's have a look at actually sales by territory. So if you're looking at DSLR, the biggest buyer of DSLRs in the world is Europe at 38.6% as the last year. Then we got America's at 355 And then if we combine Asia, Japan, and China all together, then we have about 23%, more or less. So quite interesting development there as Europe stays traditional, I would say. Mm -hmm. They like their DSLRs, but the United States is not far behind. Now, let's have a look at mirrorless, Becky. So in terms of mirrorless units, Asia is actually the uh, winner. If you include China and Japan, we're looking at 40 it looks like about 40, yeah, 47%. 47 That's a big one. percent in those three. And then we've got Europe at 25.7% and America's 23%. So uh, definitely the adopters of mirrorless system or mirrorless purchases is in China, Japan and the rest of Asia. Yeah, it looks like China is one of the biggest buyers in Asia, 21.1%, incredible. Yeah, it's huge. And then we've got lenses where, again, with lenses, now this doesn't determine whether they're DSLR, mirrorless or anything else, but the uh, majority definitely goes to Asia again, which is 37%. Then we've got Europe at 31% and America's at 28%. Incredible. So those are things for the year. Do with them what you will, but it's an interesting trend. We now see what's happening. So the market is recovering from the past years, slowly but 10% up on overall shipped value is amazing figures in my books. Indeed.
Now let's move on to reviews. The first one up, we have Matt Irvin's review, who reviewed 400mm 4.5 VR lens eight months later. Still using it. Still using it. Didn't sell it on eBay. That's uh, it's really, really impressive. So this is him shooting with it with eight, for 8K video and stills, and he likes it. Yeah, I mean, the overall production value is a huge. He is very happy about it. He says that it does 99% of what he needs from 400 lens. So he doesn't need 402.8. And in terms of portability, it's fantastic. Size and weight, uh, it's well balanced with a camera like Z9. So you get the best performance in terms of watch focus speed, image quality, and the resolution when you combine those two things, like 400 mil and Z9. There you go. Now we also have a retro camera for nostalgic photographers, the Nikon DF Experience by Samuel Streetlife. Yeah, he does some tests with it. And the most important one is the hipster test. So all he did, he was staying for about an hour on the street with the camera out to see if people will notice him with the retro cameras, which are all in vogue nowadays. Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise, no one did. But he took some great pictures with it. So have a look at his review. It's an issue review because it's taken from the point of a street life photographer, which we don't see many videos nowadays of. For your weekend read and watch section, we have Nikon Sessions episode four, Editing by Nikon Europe. So in this fourth episode, we join Rishi with Harry Skeggs, Carolyn Mendelssohn and Pep Bonet as they discuss different editing techniques. Very interesting. And if you still don't know how to put the strap on your camera and you've missed Becky's video from about three years ago, Nikon released their own one with pictures as well as calling it a Nikon Maki style. Yes, I didn't actually give it a name like that. I just said how to put your Nikon strap on properly. And this is from the early, early days of the Grey's Westminster yeah. YouTube channel. Were but, those videos in black and white? Uh, no, but they were pretty fuzzy. <laughs> it might as well have been filmed. VHS style. <laughs> However, if you want to see me putting on a camera strap properly, you can do that. Otherwise, have a look at the Nikon video, which does a pictorial guide without a video. Fantastic. <laughs> Did I sound bitter? <laughs> and that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us this week. That's right. Thank you very much for watching and or listening. Please give us a like and a subscribe if you're on YouTube. Give us a follow, a rating, even a review if you're feeling generous, if you're listening on a podcast platform. Oh, yeah. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Amazon Music. And also we're going to take a week break from the podcast scene. That's right. We're going to go retire for two weeks. But then, hopefully, if you can release us something... That's we'll, going to be annoying. We'll be. <laughs> but we will see you in two weeks with another riveting podcast. We will indeed. In the meantime, if you'd like to find us on the internet, we are on Instagram. I'm at Rebecca underscore Danese. The shop is at Nikon at Grays. And I'm at Konstantin Koshkin. There you go. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.